Um, pleasure to be talking to you all this morning, um, albeit remotely. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk to you today about our technology called CES. And CES stands for Controlled Expansion of Supercritical Solutions. Um, and why we think that really CES has a lot of potential for the pharma industry going forward. So each year we spend approximately $160 billion in R&D and we put approximately 50 products on the market in the US. When you think about the efficiency of that R&D, there's a lot of opportunity to use technology to try to improve that. And within Nanoform, we focus on trying to improve the solubility and the bioavailability of drugs to enable more products to go into clinical development. And that's typically where we see a lot of clinical attrition. So from a pharmac pharmacokinetic improvement perspective, we have opportunity to enhance the rate of dissolution by making nanoparticles. We can improve bioavailability. We can reduce the dosing. We've shown that we can reduce this um, by as much as 60%. And further PK studies, we believe we could easily reduce it by as much as 90%, which would have a significant impact on pharmaceutical manufacturing. Also, potentially reduce side effects, um, have an improvement in toxicology and hepatic load. There's obviously, obviously lots of other opportunities for making, using nanoparticles for drug delivery applications, whether it's ophthalmic in the eye, deep lung penetration, transdermal uh, drug delivery, the panacea, which would be blood-brain barrier penetration, and getting improved tumor penetration for making uh, nanoparticles that can go across the tight junctions into a tumor macro environment. And commercially, we want to try to enable new drugs to progress into clinic, extend life cycle on existing products. You know, 60% of all pharma small molecules are salts. We could actually make them a free base or a free acid or a neutral species, and make, but make them a nanoparticle and have potentially a lower dose, a safer product, maybe enable pediatric formulations, et cetera. And our, our process is patented. Um, both in the US and in Japan, uh, patents received last year, and a patent spending in Europe. So it gives good opportunity to enhance patent protection for our pharma partners' products. Um, obviously, if we're um, reducing dose, there's a good opportunity to have significant reduction in manufacturing volumes for both the drug substance and the drug product, um, and help to lead towards the drive towards carbon neutral manufacturing goals and environmental impact. So what's the issue at the moment um, with small molecules? It really is low bioavailability. Um, most products in development um, are in the class two, for the BCS class, um, and the ones that are on the market, um, there's a good proportion there as well. If you can reduce particle size, you can have a good impact to these types of products. Um, and the reason that a lot of drugs fail in phase one is because of poor bioavailability or low efficacy. There's other reasons as well, but they are the main contributing factor. So making nanoparticles is all well and good. And some people would say that a nanoparticle is something that exists below one micron. Um, but as you can see on the left of this slide, as you go from 10 microns down to 100 nanometers, you get a 30 fold improvement in specific surface area. And that might be sufficient for some products. But if you can get down to 50 nanometers, you get a 1,000 fold improvement in specific surface area. And that's a game changer because there you not only improve the intrinsic, the, the dissolution rate, you actually impact the intrinsic dissolution of the molecule. And that's what we can do at Nanoform. And as you can see on the right here, this is bulk API, pre nanoformed and post uh, nanoformed, we're effectively increasing that surface area to change the properties of the drug and how they will behave in the body. This is the company history in brief. In 2008, Professor Edward Hegstrom from the University of Helsinki um, founded, um, started working with Professor Yuko Ularussi. Yuko was a former student of Peter York's from Bradford Particle Engineering. Um, and Yuko understood the value of supercritical CO2. Um, Yuko had been at Orion Pharma. Um, he had then uh, transitioned into an academic role. Um, he headed up pharmaceutical technology for a while at Orion. And he came to Edward and said, 
I want to try and tackle the solubility issue in pharma. Um, can we combine our efforts and use a physics approach to this? Um, so that together they looked at different options, but they ended up improving on a previous um, CO2 technology called RES by developing something called CES. And RES stood for rapid expansion of supercritical solutions and CES stands for controlled expansion of supercritical solutions. And we'll talk about the difference uh, in a second. And this technology spun out from the University of Helsinki in 2013, proof of concept was validated. 2014, um, we did some more work um, with, uh, with different molecules, but the first patent application, the company was founded and we started working um, with Orion um, to further verify the technology on a range of molecules. And then we started projects in earnest in 2016 and agreed terms, commercial terms with, with a major pharma company in 2017. We decided to test the technology, not just in dissolution, but also in PK studies. We did that in 2017. A year later, we received funding, um, private equity money, and we were able to invest that into our facilities, start constructing preclinical and GMP facilities and bringing on um, talented uh, people from uh, the international arena into the business to help support the growth of the business um, externally. Last year was a big year for us. Um, we won the CPHI award for formulation um, up against um, some, some big names. Um, and this year, we want to become a licensed pharmaceutical manufacturer. In fact, today, as we speak, uh, we have the Finnish Medicines Authority in our facility um, auditing us. Um, so fingers crossed for that. I think technology is all well and good, but you need to have good people behind it. Um, and we have a very committed team, um, very motivated personnel um, in our building and in our company. Um, and they come from all areas um, across the globe. Um, to join Nanoform and be based in Helsinki. And our values are on innovation, on quality, on partnership, and on transparency. We want to be a trusted partner um, for pharmaceutical uh, relationships. So a little bit more about the technology. CES stands for Controlled Expansion of Supercritical Solutions. Um, as you can see here, we have supercritical, uh, we have CO2 in number one, which is loaded into um, vessel two. In the vessel, we have the powder API, and that can just be bulk and API. We in introduce the carbon dioxide into that vessel and the vessel um, undergoes an increase in pressure. So this is just carbon dioxide and API, nothing else. Um, we increase that pressure until the API dissolves in uh, solution within the carbon dioxide and the, it becomes super critical. That is then taken through at point number three into a pressure um, line. And at this point, before between three and four, we undergo a very small pressure drop, just enough to initiate nucleation. And this is one of the key differences between the CES process and the REST process. Um, REST was a rapid expansion. So it went from high pressure down to low pressure in one step. And that gave an uncontrolled crystallization event. It meant that you had mixtures of polymorphs it meant that you had um, amorphous and crystalline material, and you had a high, um, you, you had less control of the process and have batch to batch inconsistencies. Obviously, as um, Jean Rene talked about in his last talk, you know, consistency and reducing variability is very important for pharmaceutical production. So we wanted to introduce a control process where you got very good control of, um, of your crystallization event. So this small pressure drop is enough to initiate nucleation in the line. And then we atomize that, a bit like spray drying, into a collection chamber, as you see in number five. In that atomization event, when the droplets expand, they are effectively a nanonuclei suspension of API that expands. And as it expands, they rapidly freeze, and they freeze around the API particle. So we form what looks like snow. It looks like it's snowing in the, uh, in the collection chamber. And for Helsinki and Finland, they're quite used to managing snow, um, uh, but, um, but it, it is quite fascinating to watch. So we form this mountain of snow in the collection chamber. Once we've collected enough material, we can then depressurize the system 
and allow the CO2 to sublime off as a gas. And that leaves you with a dry nanoparticle powder. And it is possible to make this process um, continuous. Um, and we are um, looking at that right now. Hopefully this video will work. And you can actually see the snow being produced in real time. So over the last few years, we've scaled up the technology um, substantially. Every year we've gone up by a factor of 10. Um, in 2013, we're in the picogram um, per hour uh, volumes. We're now in the 100 grams per hour uh, volumes. It really depends on the molecule, how soluble it is in CO2. Some compounds are more soluble than others. So for example, phenofibrate, uh, we've been able to get 500 grams an hour, other molecules slightly less but on average around about 100 grams an hour. And as you can see on the picture on the right, this is our GMP facility that we've just now um, installed. Um, so a lot of opportunity to scale up technology, a lot of fine tuning as we've gone, um, gone forward, but we've ultimately used a physics approach to try and make sure that the technology is scalable and reproducible. So a bit more now about our development and manufacturing capabilities. We're based up here in, um, in Finland, in the, uh, in the top left of this, this image um, in Helsinki. We're just between um, the airport and uh, the city of Helsinki in the University Science Park. And we occupy um, the building um, next to the, uh, the map there. Um, and we've built a GMP facility in the right-hand side of that building uh, in the A-wing. And we have plans to build further facilities in the B-wing and then in other buildings um, going forward. Um, you can see down um, below the actual schematic of the GMP facility. So we have social area where we move through controlled access into um, laboratory space, offices um, separated by a corridor. Um, we have several R&D lines at the moment that are non-GMP and a pilot line so that we can effectively tech transfer the process into the GMP facility. We have analytical um, labs as well and microbiology and then our clean room um, and controlled access point into the GMP area. Um, so an update on the GMP status, the construction work is complete. QC, R&D and clean room areas are now operational and working. Um, pending the uh, approval by the Finnish Medicines Authority, um, we look forward to taking our partners' products into this facility. We will take our own products through there first to de-risk um, any um, GMP approval, uh, and that is what we're doing um, so that we don't place that risk on our partners. Um, the facility can handle SafeBridge category 3A, um, so we're down to the one microgram per meter cubed um, OEL le levels, and um, we're keeping our fingers crossed, as we say, on the inspection this week. So typically, we operate in a two-stage process, proof of concept, through to proof of process. So the proof of concept study will be to answer the question, can we nanoform this drug for our partner or not? What type of material do we produce? Is it crystalline? Is it the right polymorph? Is it a stable amorphous? Um, is it a certain specific size or surface area? Does it give the right dissolution um, profile for our partner um, before they then put that into animals? Um, then we would move once we've identified the right parameters and proof of concept to further refining those in a proof of process study. And this is where we would introduce a quality by design approach, looking at um, a limited factorial design of experiments, um, building in the design space and making sure that the process is robust. It can be scalable and it can be reproduced before we move into GMP manufacture. Um, and this effectively um, shows our, our thought process through the um, quality by design approach we need to understand the quality target product profile, understand the critical quality attributes that are essential for that profile, build in the risk assessment, understand the design space, and then further control and continually improve that process as we go along. From a manufacturing perspective, um, it's very important to make sure that, you know, it's everything we do is to the highest level of quality um, so we have an assessment tool 
where we'll look at a specific set of criteria built in during the development phase, ensuring a robust process before commercial launch. We need um, the criteria measured includes EHS impact, throughput, operability, process performance and yield. And if those criteria cannot be met, met, then red flags must be raised, allowing a proactive and collaborative response to issue mitigation. And the manufacturability assessments will be performed for all customer API in our GMP facility. And then from an operational excellence perspective, um, it's essential that we, we operate under the Lean Six Sigma approach, um, making sure um, that we are always focused on making the processes cost efficient and reducing as much um, error um, or uh, variability in the process so we can get a consistent product at all times for our partners. So now I'm gonna run through some case studies with you. And these just exemplify some products that we've worked on. Um, so the first product we're gonna talk about is Peroxicam. Um, we've done a lot of work on this, this material um, and it's used often as an academic um, example for poorly soluble drugs. Um, as you can see, talking about consistency we get here a very, very tightly controlled particle size distribution um, and very reproducible. So our particle size distributions typically have a span of less than one or less than two. Um, they are very, very narrow. Um, and when you think about micronization and milling, you often get bimodal distributions um, and these top-down approaches can cause, can cause issues with the material. But because this is a bottom-up approach, and because we're able to control the way the particles are formed, we get good consistency. Um, we've also done stability of the material over a three year period, and we see no change in crystallinity or particle size or chemical purity. And the, the D50 values here are approximately 160, 70 nanometers. And we've made particles as small as 10 nanometers. Um, most compounds we can get down to 50 nanometers. Um, but where we see the value um, over and above other technologies in the marketplace is delivering material that is less than 100 nanometers. Um, and that is something that is readily achievable uh, via our process. I'm going to show you here um, just a couple of videos to see how does the API particles actually behave in a flowability perspective. So here we have Peroxicam. This is 150 nanometer pure API. And you can see that the particles actually have very good flowability characteristics. And I'll show you here, this is another drug where the D50 value is 100 nanometers. And again, very good powder flow. Now, what's important to note is that particles of this size, they do want to agglomerate, they do want to aggregate. Um, the physical forces of attraction are so high when they are so small. But the good thing is, that they don't aggregate together and then form bridges and recrystallize. They, they aggregate together and then with a small amount of energy, they can be redispersed or um, uh, re-disaggregated, shall we say, into a, into a powder uh, environment for tablets or capsules. Um, and it's that aggregation that actually provides benefit for handling um, these nanoparticles as well. They behave more like micron-sized particles. So here we just wanted to test the, um, the peroxicam in a suspension um, to make sure that uh, the particles um, behaved and could be easily suspended. We wanted to do an oral suspension for dosing into rats. Um, and we see here that the nanoparticles um, actually have very good suspension stability um, versus the micronized material. We looked at the SEM images um, of the API in suspension and we can see that the particles are still discrete individual primary particles, um, which is good. They haven't formed bridges or, or re-aggregated in suspension. And then this data we're very pleased um, to show. This is data that we've conducted um, in a recent PK study. And as you can see on the diagram on the left, the nano-formed uh, line, which is at the top, this is 20 milligrams, um, dosing in comparison to the micronized dose of 20 milligrams shows at least twice the area under the curve compared to the micronized material, which means that it is readily absorbed into the animal's body. 
Um, this gives us a great opportunity for dose reduction uh, for this particular drug. And we've also shown that in lower doses, um, the material um, actually correlates and produces quarter of the uh, dose, uh, higher doses. So five mig is quarter of 20 mig, but only half of the 20 mig, 10 mic, um, half of the 20 mig micronized material. So what are we comparing here? The micronized material in this example was actually the fast dissolving polymorph, but the material produced by our process was the slow dissolving polymorph. So when you looked at this from an in vitro dissolution perspective, um, there was some improvement from the nanoform material, um, but it wasn't amazing. But when you put it into animals, the improvement was dramatic, as we can see here. And here we're only using particles that are in the two to 300 nanometer range. So we're gonna go and repeat this study um, with particles less than 100 nanometers to prove the value of um, particles in that space and how that increase in specific surface area correlates to a reduction in dosage um, in, the, in the animal study. So here, just a conclusion and takeaway, we get a faster Tmax, a higher Cmax, and a larger AUC. Phenofibrates. So this molecule um, has several different polymorphs, but I wanted to show you some different types of compounds that we've worked on. When we first started um, looking at phenofibrates, um, initial runs gave in the order of 10 microns, um, so quite large. Um, we then controlled the parameters and we were able to um, alter the particles that were produced going from five microns down to two, down to 1.6, 1.4, 1.3, by altering the parameters of the process. And then we looked at the increasing nanonization temperature and what effect that might have. So we go from 68 degrees here to 87, and we reduce the particle size from 920 nanometers to 450. The next um, experiments that we'll be doing is increasing the pressure on the line to take it down even further. And um, we hope to, to be able to produce sub 100 nanometer particles of phenofibrate. But you can see here in the temperature dependency, it's very important to be able to map out the properties of the process and how they influence the particles um, that we can produce. The solid state properties of phenofibrate are shown here. So we have produced the same polymorph. Um, and as you can see, albeit these particles on the right are quite large, um, they're actually very uniform in terms of the crystallization properties, their morphology, um, not only unimodal distribution, but uniform morphology controlled to the bulk, compared to the bulk. And again, from a formulation perspective, we believe that to be highly valuable to reduce the variability um, in formulation. Um, here's another example using glyclozide. Glyclozide is a type two um, diabetic treatment. There's one anhydrate and there is an amorphous form. Um, as you can see here on the image on the left, this is the bulk micronized material, typically in the 20 to 30 micron um, size range uh, on one axis and maybe um, uh, sort of five to 10 on the other axis. Here we've shown aspect ratio control. So when we formed the nanoformed particles, we're actually producing particles with approximately 300 nanometers in one axis and 100 nanometers in another. And particularly if you have needle-like morphology, um, the last thing you want to do is to nanomill that material because you're only going to get needle-like nanoparticles. Whereas what you can do here is actually change the aspect ratio of the particles produced um, and um, effectively their morphology. When we're talking about particles that are very small in the 50 nanometer uh, range or perhaps less than that, there's only probably so many molecules in that crystal. So actually the way that the particles form and the way that the crystals are produced means that the, this, the structural packing of that crystal um, may give different morphologies than you would typically um, see on a macro level. Um, here we can see um, the FDIR and the XRPD, just to confirm that what we've produced is um, indeed the same polymorph. But this data is the most exciting data. 
a formulation scientist that had spent uh, much time at AstraZeneca and Orion, um, Satu Lakia, saw this, uh, these results and said, wow, in her whole time in Korea, she's never seen a material instantly dissolve um, like this glycoside uh, did in this study. Um, I'm a uh, slightly slight novice in this area, but um, I was impressed to hear that and um, we'll be conducting more studies um, with this compound to see the benefits that nanoforming it can have. I just want to show you before um, we stop going through the case studies that not only can we produce crystalline material, we can also produce amorphous particles as well. And typically those amorphous particles tend to be stable, um, which is quite unusual. You would think that making small nanoparticles that are amorphous would mean that they would increase their surface area, they would inc uh, increase um, their instability. But in fact, we see the opposite effect. Um, here we've made budesonide, uh, we take crystalline material, but through the process it makes amorphous um, particles. And we're able to tune the particle size from 200 nanometers down to 100, and we've gone down even to 50 nanometers um, for this material. Um, why do we think that that you know, why do we think that some of these amorphous materials are stable? Um, we believe that it's the matrix, uh, the matrix effect. So the way that the particles stack upon each other, um, they have, as you can see in the image on the bottom right, lots of space in between them. Um, and we believe that this might be adding some stability uh, to those um, particles and powders. And of course, this is with no um, excipient um, or surfactant involved. So I'm going to show you now um, some data on how our particles behave in a, a formulation environment. So the first, um, first example is with peroxicam, and here we've used tablatos. Um, on the left-hand side, this is the lactose carrier on its own. In the middle is a blend with 10% um, of a micronized peroxicam two micron size particles. And on the right is 10% with nanoformed peroxicam, um, typically um, in the region of around uh, one to 200 nanometer particles. And you can see a very, very nice covering. And one of the aspects that our formulation uh, team have, have said is that actually when you introduce the lactose to the API nanoparticle, there are some electrostatics. Um, and when you introduce the lactose, the nanoparticles go vroom, and they just want to stick and coat the, uh, the lactose particles. So you get a very nice uniform coating um, as, a, as a result. Here is also some other um, molecules. Um, we talk about this network structure, this matrices that we sometimes see with the amorphous um, particles. Glycoside, budesonide, carbidilol are all APIs that we've seen that have given this amorphous um, structure. Um, and but what we wanted to answer, the question is, can we then um, disaggregate that structure um, when we formulate? So we took um, here some, um, I think this was a, an inhalation grade um, lactose and mixed it with our, our budesonide. And as you can see quite clearly, the particles do break up into um, uh, their constituent parts um, in, the nano, in the nano range and coat the, the budesonide um, coat the lactose very well. So just to recap, from a powder blend perspective, we're able to utilize inherent electrostatic properties. The nanoformed material forms loose aggregates, which are easily redispersible. The network structure of nanoformed material could be more stable compared to loose individual particles, since there is space in between the particles. And we think that powder blends can be used for tableting, capsule filling, um, and in some case, also for DPIs. In fact, in the peroxicam PK study, um, we had uh, the 20 milligram dose, we were using um, an oral suspension, um, but the five milligram, um, we actually did that as a pure API powder in capsule. Um, and that performed equally as well as the suspension. So just to recap, um, why we believe small is powerful. Um, there's great opportunity to use particle engineering and particularly particles in the nanospace to increase solubility, 
increase the bioavailability. What does that mean? It means you can also reduce the dosage for a lot of products. Um, that might be enabling for some combination products. There's lots of products there on the marketplace where they're relatively high dose um, and you can't really combine them in the same pill. But we think that opens up a lot of opportunity there, potentially reducing side effects, so benefit to the patient, reducing the size of the pill, benefit to elderly patients that have trouble swallowing large pills. Um, of course, if you reduce dosage, you reduce production costs, reduce capex requirement for manufacturing. We want to increase environmental sustainability. This moves in line and in parallel with a lot of our major pharma partners' goals for carbon neutral footprint. And obviously, this opens up a lot of opportunity to further patent protect our partners' products and enable new drugs to the market. So thank you very much for your time. Small is powerful. Let's unlock the potential of your molecules together. And as you can see, this is our team here in Helsinki. We're very passionate. Um, and uh, this was us after we received the CPHI Pharma Awards. Um, and we want to uh, embrace that passion and work with you to support your product development. Thank you very much.